Happy NFL kickoff night, everybody. Welcome to Cover 4 Live. Hopefully we are part of your two-screen experience tonight as you're getting ready to watch the uh, Bucks and the Cowboys and getting ready to talk some Georgia football here or there as well. And certainly there is plenty to talk about in that regard. You see three faces on your screen right now. Connor Riley, Jeff Sintel. Mike Griffith will be on in just a little bit. He's, as we say in the business, he is on assignment currently, but he will be here in just a little bit. Obviously big news to get to, although I guess it's more – innuendo than actual news it's suggestions i'm actually curious to find out what both of you uh, think about this i certainly talked about it a lot this morning on dog nation daily the report that jt daniels is dealing with i guess what some people are calling upper body injury others have called an oblique i had to google what an oblique even was i'm not a physiology major so i had to you know figure all this kind of stuff out but nonetheless status in question for saturday's game against uab uh, Denny Thompson, the quarterback's coach that tutored Carson Beck, apparently told some folks down in Jacksonville that he thought the Beck was going to start on Saturday uh, for Georgia. This is all very new and very fast moving, and uh, speculation outweighs the actual facts by about 100 pounds here. But, Jeff, I guess I'll start with you. Big picture, what do you think of what has been said and just everything that's kind of going on here? Uh, you think this is a, some sort of master chess game, uh, to use that phrase, uh, from Kirby Smart, maybe to take some of the, the, the polarization off the offense a little bit. You think that's in the, in the, in the works or you think this is just simply an injury where JT Daniels wasn't supposed to play a whole lot anyway. And perhaps you don't really need a JT Daniels to beat what I still consider to be a very good UAB team. And, um, I think most would agree that getting, uh, JT Daniels through the Clemson game healthy and upright was a win through all scenarios, especially when you win the football game, especially when he came into the contest, as we've reported on dognation.com, with an injury he suffered in the preseason. Yeah, the one thing I'm confident in saying is this is not all part of some master plan. No, I, I don't think that's what's going on here. And I think you were tongue in cheek when you suggested that. Uh, but I am very curious to see how it all unfolds. I saw Matthew Pratt in the comment section. A moment ago, said he thought that there was a hundred percent chance that JT, Dan I'm sorry, that uh, that Carson Beck starts on Saturday. Mike, I'm glad to have you with us. What would you put the percentage chances at that Beck starts on Saturday? If you're even comfortable speculating, you don't have to give me a specific number, but more or less than fifty percent. I mean, I really, I really don't know, Brandon. I know that JT Daniels will play. That if if he can play, if there's any way he can play, he's going to play. Uh, you know, the fact that the JT did practice uh, at least uh, a couple days this week, I, I, I probably put it uh, probably 60, 40 that JT starts. But okay. you know, I, I could be wrong, you know, just based on the fact that he was able to practice, based on the fact that after the game uh, there was no uh, a sign of imminent danger or peril, his style of play wasn't affected, uh, he was able to make all the throws, he was able to protect himself. Um, maybe, you know, 25% chance Carson Beck starts. Okay. Thank you for uh, giving me a percentage on that. Uh, Connor, what do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I agree a lot with Mike. I think we're going to probably see a lot of Carson Beck in this game. If JT Daniels is playing in the second half, uh, something terrible has gone wrong, or he's just very, he is healthy enough to play. And Georgia's, I just think, trying to manage him, especially with what now is going to be a remade offensive line. Tate Ratledge breaks his foot and is unfortunately out for the season for Georgia. So it is not going to be a full strength Georgia offensive line out there. I think that's important to keep in note. Uh, this UAB defense is very good. I believe they ranked sixth last season in, in yards uh, allowed per play. Uh, one of the better defenses Georgia will probably see this season. Certainly, I think a better defense they will see in the month of September. And at, the, at a certain point in time, Georgia needs to find out what it has in Carson Beck as well. And I think this is a good opportunity for him because he didn't get a chance to play last year. He played at the Missouri game, did not throw a pass. And I, I get JT Daniels, he's missed time before. And I think Georgia needs to know what it has in Carson Beck, a guy who was clearly won the uh, backup quarterback job by, based off his performance this spring and this fall. And having him go out there and play and do it in live reps, I think is going to be another key point in the maturation of Carson Beck. And if, it happens in the first quarter. It happens in the first quarter. But I expect to still see a lot of Carson Beck on Saturday, regardless of the status of JT Daniels. So it's funny hearing all of you speak and knowing my own opinion on this. I just really feel like I'm, I'm kind of different than a lot of people here. I certainly agree that it'd be nice to know what Georgia has in Carson Beck. But I got to tell you, as a Georgia fan, as somebody who roots for Georgia to win, 
the news as it's unfolded related to Daniels the last couple of days, I find to be pretty concerning because while I am very curious to find out what Georgia has in Carson Beck, frankly, I'm still trying to figure out what Georgia has in JT Daniels. This is only going to be his sixth star in a Georgia uniform on Saturday if he's capable of making it. This is a guy who spent most of 2019 and 2020 not playing football at all. And for Georgia to be as good as I need for them to be, I'm speaking as a fan here, as a partisan, somebody who wants Georgia to win, uh, for, for somebody who needs Georgia offense to be ready to roll come October, and that's kind of what we saw on the show this week, that you got to be ready to go in October. If your starting quarterback is not able to play on Saturday, then all of that is slowed down. All of that progress is slowed down. Notice I'm saying slowing down and not, you know, ending, you know, it's not doom and gloom. I'm not saying it's ruined. But to even hear the idea that Daniels is potentially too hard to play for an offense that needs every rep that it can to get better, even as the defensive competition it's facing is about to go down, they still got to improve. I don't think you improve if JT Daniels is not playing. But do you have? Do you think Georgia has the wide receivers this week to to make those necessary steps forward? Because I'm not sure they do. It doesn't sound like Kyrus Jackson is going to be out there playing offensive snaps. Dominic Blaylock is a maybe at best there. And so even if you're putting JT Daniels out there, I still don't think this wide receiver core is going to be where it needs to be. Hearing Kirby Smart talk about Jermaine Burton this week, he needs game reps. He needs practice reps out there to get up to full strength. And so, I, you know, I'm not sure how much the quarterback matters there when it comes to the status of Jermaine Burton. And given Dominic Blaylock and Kyrus Jackson, I think are two of your top three other receivers. And at Darnell Washington, you can throw in there as well. I don't think – well, you make a valid point on trying to figure out what JT Daniels is. I don't think Georgia right now has its full cachet of weapons to really showcase what that would be. I think it's a fair point. Some of the guys that would be playing are guys that you'll also be counting on later in the season. But you're right. There are still a lot of guys that you want to see Daniels throw to that he won't be throwing to on Saturday. I guess, Jeff, what my point here on all this is, is I don't think it's a non-issue if Daniels is not able to play. Like, we're way too early in this season to be thinking about setting yourself up for 2022 with Carson Beck. You know, if, if Daniels is not able to play on Saturday, that's not some diabolical plan on the part of Georgia. That's a clear setback for a guy that came back in 2021 to play. If he's not playing in the second game of the season, then that's just objectively true. That's not good for Georgia. So I got a, I got a little sub narrative for you, BA, and it's the type that uh, talk show fodder would love to uh, crank up next week. Let's say Beck gets the majority of snaps. And he wrecks it. He goes 275, three touchdowns, looks very sharp and efficient in doing so. What do each of you think that the, the, will be the narrative that fans and maybe fans and or the media will latch on to? Will they? I'm not, will I, they I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care what the fan narrative is coming out of the game. Uh, I'll just put that out there right now. Thank you, well, Connor. But, it, but <laughs> if it's loud enough, though, it's hard to ignore. And I understand what you're saying, that, 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 that you know, fans are going to say what they say no matter what, and I'll be you know, kind of a part of that conversation too. But it's, if it's loud enough, it's hard to ignore. Here's what I'll say, Jeff, and then I want to let Mike speak on this because he hasn't gotten a chance to in a minute. This is not – even if, if, if Carson Beck played as well against UAB as J, JT Daniels played against Mississippi State, like if he had that kind of game, wow. this is still not Jake from uh, Jacob Eason, and I'll tell you why. Even though it was a limited sample size for Daniels a year ago in those four games that he started, he still played better than Eason did in 2016. I'm a big fan of Eason, but most of my fanship of Eason is related to the way that he left George. He was a class actor on his way out the door. Uh, to me, he'll always be a DGD because he did not ruffle feathers after he got the starting job taken from him. He sat there, he smiled, he went on to Washington, now he's in the NFL, and I hope he starts with the Colts. Like, I, I got nothing bad to say about uh, Jacob Eason. He did not have a great freshman season playing for Georgia. Completed fewer than 60% of his passes. It was not obvious that Jacob Eason was a great quarterback after uh, almost a full year starting in 2016. I think that in a small sample size, Daniels has proven more in 2020 than Eason did in 2016. There is no chance in my mind for this to be a, a, a from Eason deal because I think Daniels has already proven more than Eason had in 2016. Mike, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot to unpack. Um, a lot has been said tonight. I, I think that, uh, you know, JT is the leader of the team. I think it's his offense. I think he's done uh, far more than Carson can do in one game. I mean, that's not a knock against Carson. I mean, you know, Carson's proven himself by sticking it out, you know, even when they went with uh, Stetson Bennett over him. And there were times we wondered if Carson Beck would stick it out after Brock Vandegrift signed. I mean, 
Uh, Jeff practically wrote a book and anointed him king with the building of Brock. I mean, my goodness, what is Carson Beck thinking reading all this about a talented guy like Brock Vandegrift and he's just sitting there not being able to play behind Stetson Bennett all last year. You know, we're raving about Brock Vandegrift and what an incredible talent he is coming in. And yet Carson Beck was, was able to get through that, what had to be a very challenging time. So in my mind, he's proven a lot. But JT Daniels has proven more. JT Daniels would have been the number one player in, in his classification in the country had he not graduated a year early. And as it was, he was only ranked behind two quarterbacks in the quarterback rankings, Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence. So uh, this is a guy that's done a lot, uh, certainly proven a lot. He's got a lot of scars, uh, figuratively and literally, from the time at USC. Uh, there's something to be said for that experience. I mean, think about, you know, all of us here at different points in our careers and places we've been and times we've had to slug it out and, you know, why that makes you the person that you are. I mean, that's a character building time for JT Daniels to, you know, uh, not have success under the bright lights of, you know, USC, which, you know, Connor feels like can light up the whole West coast. Uh, and I would say he's right in terms of the amount of exposure the Trojans get to go from being the celebrated can't miss figure to the guy that can't get you to a bowl game and an offense that's got everything going wrong with different play callers and uh, poor snaps and inadequate line protection only to come back the next year, get off to a great start and have it all taken away from you in the first half of the first game. And then you learn that maybe, maybe it really isn't a 50 50 chance to win the job. Maybe the offensive coordinator already favors the next guy. And so now your dream of Southern Cal, your vision, it's changed and you've got to leave. And you go all the way across the country and you put all your eggs in the Georgia basket only to find out that your knee doesn't allow you to take the starting job and you have to wait. Not only do you have to wait, you have to go to the scout team. And so JT has come a long way, climbed the mountain, threw for over 400 yards. We saw it. Uh, then the next game he was asked to hand off because Kirby didn't want to hurt his old friend's feelings against South Carolina. Then he played in sub 30 degree weather against Missouri, got nailed a few times, but still made some good passes. Then he had a makeshift offensive line, probably had South, Southern Cal flashbacks and had to bring Georgia from behind. Uh, so this is a guy that's been through a lot. I, I know I belabor all this, but and what's Carson Beck done? Well, he's been tough and stuck it out, but other than a pretty good G-Day game performance, he's looked good in warm-up. So can one day over outweigh all that PA? I'm, I'm just not sure. So here's the problem that I have, not with what Mike said, but just about the situation in general. Like every injury or player absence or everything this year has started off as, I'm not about the last couple months, has started off as, oh, nothing to see here, no big deal. <laughs> Actually update the story. This guy's going to be out for five weeks or he may never play again or, 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 you know, whatever else the update of these kind of stories ends up being. So as one of my commenters on video said today, um, uh, you know, something to the effect of, listen, um, I'll believe anything, but I don't believe, but, but you know, it, it's basically like I'm willing to believe anything, but I don't actually believe anything when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like I can't right now feel like I know how healthy JT Daniels is. My theory is if we're even talking about it, then he must be hurt. Otherwise it wouldn't even come up. That's kind of my theory on this. And the idea that this is going to magically disappear after UAB week is gone. I'm just skeptical that that's true. This is the kind of thing that lingers for a couple of weeks. And listen, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not trying to tell you you should listen to my medical expertise on this. But if it does linger for a couple of weeks, speaking as someone who's very excited about Daniels, the starting quarterback for Georgia, I start to get concerned about, about whether or not there's some sort of downgrade there if Daniels isn't healthy because by the oblique, and I did Google this, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that helps you propel the throw, whether it's a baseball pitcher, football quarterback, or whatever else. I'm a little concerned to the extent that Daniels might be injured and Warren McClendon and Ladd McConkie saying it's no big deal does not necessarily convince me that's true. B.A., does – Georgia can beat Car uh, UAB with Carson Beck, correct? I think they could beat UAB with any of the quarterbacks probably on the roster. But Do you think that. the same with South Carolina? Yeah, probably so. Do you think the same with Vanderbilt? I'm going to keep saying yes, but here's what I'm going to tell you. The odds of Georgia being good on the road at Auburn on October 9th go down if Daniels is not playing in these games. This is supposed to be what we commonly call a tune-up game. 
But if you're tuning up the 2022 quarterback instead of the 2021 quarterback, you're just missing the chance to get better. I'm not saying you push JT Daniels out there. I'm saying I find myself more concerned about the possibility than he that he might be injured than some Georgia fans seem to think. You know, I, there are some Georgia fans who are trying to have it both ways. They're trying to say, oh, this is no big deal. JT Downs is fine. But this is also the reason why they didn't throw deep last week against Clemson. Like both those things can't be true. Either Daniels is hurt or he's not. And if he's not, then you ought to play on Saturday. And if he is, then you start to wonder, well, when does this clear up? Because the longer it lingers, the more that it has the potential to become a problem if it's even real. But if we do believe that it's hurt, which it sounds like you do, and it sounds like Mike and, and Jeff do as well, isn't the smart play for here to Georgia to manage it right now? I agree with that. I've said a lot this week related to wide receivers that if you think about an A player and a B player, I'm of the belief, it seems like most football coaches the same way, that 100% of the B player is better, more valuable than 85% of the A player. And I'm obviously making those percentages. But a healthy backup is better than a high-quality NFL caliber starter. And most coaches seem to operate on that assumption. So, yes, if he is hurt, you can't play him. But what I'm saying is – that some Georgia fans are like, oh, it's no big deal, it's just UAB if he doesn't play. And I'm telling you, there is a little bit of a price to be paid if Daniels is too hurt to play on Saturday. That's the kind of thing that you could feel the effects of later on. Well, you know what I always say, the best ability is availability. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Jeff, jump back in here and we'll change the subject. Uh, this dog muted him. Uh, I think you may have, uh, your dog, uh, Peaches, may have muted your computer there. Still muted. Still muted. <laughs> Peaches. What's what's happening is Michael is in the back muting myself when I'm unmuting me. Unmuting. Oh, okay. <laughs> we got two guys calling the plays here, Brandon. We got to kick one of them out of the huddle. Maybe, maybe, maybe three guys. You count, count the dog Peaches down. <laughs> so so here's what I'm thinking. Simple question. What's the best thing for Georgia? Is it to get JT in here and – and let him pilot the jet when maybe not all of his Tomahawk missiles are underneath the wing, Mike Griffith. Is it, I look at it this way. Everybody wants him to get sharp. Everybody wants him to get seasoned. Folks, the Georgia weapons aren't going to be here against UAB regardless. So you do really need JT in here to tough it out and maybe roll the dice a little bit when all of his weapons aren't there? Or is the best thing for Georgia to see what you can do and not risk, quote unquote, the franchise quarterback right now in week two? Yeah, you had a you had Jermaine Burton is the, the the engine flaming out last week and, and and getting caught in the Clemson jet wash. Jet wash. Yeah, a jet wash for J. You know, he went to fire. He hit. He called in. The missiles aren't working, Coach. Yeah, the let the McConkey missiles not hooked up yet. It, not sure where to run. And Jermaine block doesn't, Burton doesn't want to block anybody. You know, listen, Kirby leaned hard, and and I say that. And I think Connor's done enough press conferences now to recognize that when a coach drops a name, it's not by accident. Okay. And, and Kirby dropped three guys that screwed up on one play with purpose. Not only did he put those players on notice, that's putting the position coach on notice. You, you better get your guys to line up right. They better know who to block. They better execute that Cortez Hankton, that, you know, a lot of free coats, great for the community, but you better get your guys doing the right things on Saturdays or, or it's going to be a short trip for you here in, in Athens. Look, Kirby's playing for all the marbles, man. Th this is a window. And I, while I don't think it's national champ or championship or bust, the reality is if you start looking at that defense, Lewis seen Christopher Smith, Nicobe Dean, Jordan Davis, Trayvon Walker, Devonte Wyatt, Adam Anderson, they're not going to be here next year. This is a prime opportunity, and it's up to everyone. And Kirby said it earlier today. Uh, you don't execute, you're not going to be on the field. And they were fortunate on defense in the secondary that Clemson did not exploit them. So the, the, the breakdowns in the secondary, we talked about preseason. Those were real. The breakdowns in the receiving core, I've preached over and over. This is not LSU in Alabama. This isn't even Alabama State in Louisiana level receivers that we saw last week. My goodness, Brandon, I'm not going to say anything about a clown show. I'll stop short there, but it certainly wasn't up to par. So interesting time to make a transition to the offense then, because regardless of whatever may be going on with the uh, quarterbacks here, I mean, this is a day that Georgia fans do want to see more for the offense. And listen, we stayed very consistent about this throughout the week on Dog Nation Daily. I really don't care how Georgia beat Clemson. Just beating Clemson's enough for me. 
But on the basis of not moving the football very well against Clemson, there is a need to improve in that regard. And, and, and frankly, given the current injury situation and the way the, the team played on Saturday, I'm of the belief that improvement, if it does occur, is going to happen somewhat slowly, somewhat deliberately. So, you know, with that in mind, you know, Connor, and it's hard to talk about this without obviously bringing the quarterback thing back into it, but trying to put that aside as much as possible. What do you expect from the Georgia offense on Saturday? What do you think fans should want to see? What's even reasonable at this point? Well, what fans should want to see and what they're going to see are, I think, going to be two different things. I think Georgia's going to lean on its running game. I, I think they're going to try and get the passing game involved, but I don't know how much success they're going to have. This UAB defense is pretty legit. And while you know they might not have the talent advantage that Georgia does on offense, they're going to make Georgia work for it. And JT Daniels certainly doesn't sound healthy. And so because of that, I expect a low-scoring game. I do think that Georgia's going to be able to run the ball pretty well in this game. I, I think that's going to be an area where that really shows up. I would look for a big day from both Zamir White and Kendall Milton. I think you're going to see more of what you saw late last week against Clemson. But as far as a passing offense, if if Blaylock, Kiaris Jackson, Jermaine Burton is clearly not 100%. Marcus Rosemey Jackson is still getting up to speed. If all those guys are still question marks at the wide receiver position, I, I, I don't know how much your quarterback position really matters, just given what we've seen in college football in recent years. Uh, you know, Mac Jones and Joe Burrow, yes, they were exceptional quarterbacks. It also helps that they were throwing to multiple first-round picks. And so, you know, Georgia at right now you does, just does not have that out there, and they're not going to have that out there against UAB. And until that wide receiver position, to me, gets healthy, it, it's hard to fairly judge this Georgia offense and, and understand – what we're ultimately going to see with this group. I think this group is going to get healthier. I'm personally more interested in what we see this offense look like against South Carolina, against Vanderbilt, against Arkansas, when I do think these team, when this team is going to get healthier and, quite frankly, play defenses that are, I think, not quite as good as this UAB unit. Yeah, I think that's right. So Johnny Lester in the comment section brings up Cortez Hankton. Mike, I know you mentioned him too. Here, here's my thing about Hankton. Like, I can't scapegoat him for the Georgia passing attack not being successful, not because I know what Hankton's doing, because the honest truth is I really don't, but I do know this. The talent level in the Georgia receiver room has been higher in the couple of years that he's been here than it was the 10 years before he got here. I mean, Georgia has been a lagging program when it comes to wide receiver recruiting for years and years, predating Kirby Smart, first couple of years of Kirby Smart. You know, that change of, for the better seems to kind of coincided with uh, Cortez Hankton there. But beyond that, Mike, the responsibility here rests with, with uh, Todd Monken. That's the NFL pedigree. That's the big paycheck. That's it's his job to get something out of these guys. And that's what the, the best teams in the country have that offensive mastermind. That's winning the chess match with the other guy, his counterpart on the other side of the field. And Todd Munkin may, may very well do that before the year is done, but it's Todd Munkin who I put all the spotlight on. Uh, we talk about, you know, suits, not boots on dog Nate daily all the time. I put the I put the responsibility for the mission on the officer class, not the infantry soldiers who are, who are trying to go out there and, and, and get it done. And in the case of Munkin, he's got to devise, devise a game plan that works. And I can't scapegoat the wide receiver coach if the team's not scoring points. Well, I think that there's different levels of accountability. You might as well just say the head coach because he hired Munkin, and then you might want to say the athletic director because he hired Kirby, and then you might just want to say the University of Georgia because they hired the athletic director. The reason we drilled down to the receivers coach BA is there has been talent, but, but, but Hankton hasn't been able to develop to develop it to the extent that Matt Landers isn't here catching passes as a seasoned veteran. He's now at Toledo. Micaiah Tong is not here catching passes. He's as a third year receiver. He's at Oregon state. Demetrius Robertson is not here as a Georgia receiver. He's at Auburn. Cortez Hankton has had an opportunity to develop all these players who should be coming into their own as third and fourth year receivers. And instead they failed and transferred out and Georgia has more talent in there right now, but this new talent supposedly better than what has already left uh, is failing to execute to the point that they're not lining up property. They're not blocking on the perimeter as Kirby smart demands. And Todd Munkin has to uh, oversee the entire offense uh, I, I heard a clip one time from a practice um, and Dwan Mathis was over talking to Munkin and, and Munkin said, you know, we, we can't control where they line up. He was talking about the receivers. This, this has been an Achilles heel year after year after year for Georgia at the receiver position, <clears throat> despite, as you said, Brandon, 
the efforts that even the head coaches put in. Jeff Centel with the wonderful Centel's Intel on Wednesday nights uh, before the Hedges has told us about the efforts that Kirby Smart's put in. Some bad luck with George Pickens and, and Dominic Blaylock injuries, no doubt. But the fact that you've had five receivers transfer out in the last year is an indictment on your ability to recruit and develop guys that are capable. You either missed I, in recruiting or you failed to develop them, and so they left. That's a problem. Go ahead, go ahead. I, dis I, I disagree there. If anything, I think it shows the recruiting ability that Cortez Hankton has, bringing in guys like Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, Jermaine Burton, Arian Smith. Now, unfortunately, none of those guys have been able to stay healthy. But those guys are talented, and that's a big – and we're going to play a lot. That's why a lot of those guys transferred out. And I'd point out, Matt Landers was a James Coley signee. Like, not all those guys were evaluated by Cortez Hankton and brought in because of Cortez Hankton's. And so, well, yes, the Georgia wide receiver core needs to get better. They're missing their top three guys in terms of talent right now in, in Pickens, Blaylock, and Kiaris Jackson. Their fourth one, Jermaine Burton, is not healthy or is in the process of getting healthy again. And then Arian Smith has played in five career games, and Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint has played in seven. I, I mean, your most talented wide receivers have just really unfortunately – been bitten by the injury bug it's kind of astounding and you know you wonder if god placed a hex on the georgia wide receiver room in recent wow. years because I, I i mean it's just an unfortunate string of injuries that we can't yeah. have really see these guys develop but i absolutely believe in the talent in this room and Cortez hankton i think deserves ta deserves credit for bringing in that talent well Look, kirby smart didn't think he deserved to raise two years ago so there's probably some differences of opinions so, so here's one thing I but think. Hold on, Mike. You can't say you know why Cortez Hankton didn't get a raise. That's that, that's a two lot coaches of coaches that didn't get a raise, and one yeah. of them's gone. That's a lot of speculation. Like, I think 2019, thing. there was plenty of evidence. Look, here's the thing. I don't know what Hankton's doing. I've got no interest in defending him, but I'm also not going to scapegoat him. When you look at Alabama a year ago, LSU the year before that, what you know, Tony Elliott's in at Clemson. The most dynamic facet of college football right now is the guy calling plays on game day. You either win the battle or you don't. You either win the chess match or you don't. Now, I'm not saying Todd Munkin's not going to eventually, but that's the missing piece for Georgia in terms of winning a national championship. you got to do pre-snap motion. you got to do intermediate routes. you got to do these clever things that the best teams in the country seem to be doing. If you want to be successful like other teams have been on Saturdays, you've got to do the things that those teams are doing. And by the way, uh, they're not all doing it with five-star receivers. Chris Olave, former three-star at Ohio State. Uh, Jefferson, the first-round pick from LSU, that's a former three-star. Oklahoma turns walk-ons into big-time wide receivers. It's not the wide receiver coach that's doing that. It's the play calling that has the receivers wide open. Jeff, jump in here. Yeah, here's guys what I can't say here right now, and I'm going to be pretty bullish on this. You look at this thing, and I can't – I think Connor got a little bit of it right where, you know, a lot of those guys were James Coley receivers and everything else. Let's look at all those names that just got rattled off. Matt Landers was a three-star receiver, number 400 in the country. Um, Trey Blunt's a guy. He's now up at uh, – I believe he's up at uh, Liberty, I believe. Not Liberty, but Old I think Dominion. he's up at Old Dominion in Virginia. Another guy that was not a top 100, top 150 receiver. You see Tommy Bush is now at North Texas. Tommy Bush came out of a system where they only threw the ball like 40 times during his high school senior year. He, he came out of a run-heavy option uh, off, offense. Here's what I can't say yet. I can't say it's an indictment on one certain position coach. The one thing, if I had to sit here and think, what's the big factor folks aren't thinking about? I think it's – either bad juju, it's luck, or just injuries. If Dominic Blaylock was healthy right now and George Pickens was healthy right now, I don't think we'd be talking about George's lack of X factors at receiver. Uh, whether that's training, that's development, whether it's the kind of shoes they're wearing, whatever you want to say, George's best offensive threats that they've recruited are not on the field right now. You even look at Arian Smith, very highly rated. Arian Smith was always a developmental player. He was a speed demon track guy, and everybody evaluated him off of his, his prowess. Now, again, he's an All-American receiver, but he played both ways in high school football, and he wasn't a guy that came down with 50 catches and 12 touchdowns. Remember the name J.J. Holloman? That's another weird situation that's like a cloud hanging over the wide receiver position at Georgia. A very odd, a very off-the-beaten pack beaten path freak thing right there so you've got a lot of instances now you sit there as a smart man and you go wow this is really unlucky for Georgia is this just is this just Georgia or do you go well there's got to be something there you, the other thing you got to look at with Georgia right now is hey they plucked Lad McConkey off out of nowhere 
and he starts against Clemson on the road. I don't care whether or not he's a three-star or how many guys were in front of him. Uh, that's a developmental project right there that's working out right now. Georgia went after a different type of receiver. You look what they found with A.D. Mitchell right now. I think A.D. Mitchell looks like probably the most high-ceiling receiver that's healthy right now in the program. So you're looking at a lot of facets of that wide receiver position. I think the recruiting has gotten a lot better since Cortez Hankton is involved and in the mix here. Burton, Blaylock, Arian Smith, George Pickens, uh, Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, another guy. Let's list them off here. You want to say snake bit or you want to say just Georgia things happening? That's what's happening at the wide receiver position right now. Connor, let me ask you a question here for a moment. There's a lot of different ways to measure a top 10 offense. You can do old school stuff like the yards you accumulate. You can do new school stuff like the success rate, things like that. You can just look at points scored. But it's pretty clear that to win a national championship, you're going to be top 10 level offensively and defensively. Defensively ain't going to be a problem. We know that. By the end of the year, do you think Georgia has the capabilities, given the players that are likely to return healthy, given the likely scenarios that can unfold, can this offense be playing at a top 10 level at the end of the season? Even if the first half stats drag down the averages, can they play like a top 10 offense at the end of the season? Yes, the answer to that is yes. You're gonna get you're gonna get Dominic Blaylock back. You're gonna get Karis Jackson back. You're gonna get Jermaine Burton healthy. I think potentially you get back a guy in George Pickens, though. I'm still skeptical of when when that actually happens. You get back a Darnell Washington. This oblique injury with JT Daniels gets cleared up, and that November schedule is charming soft. Missouri, a Tennessee team that I quite frankly don't think is any good. Charleston Southern and Georgia Tech. Georgia should be able to right themselves during that November stretch and get this offense, I think, to where it needs to be. And I maybe even extend them a little bit, say maybe a top 15 defense or top 15 offense, because they quite frankly have a top one defense. And it is not yeah. just the top level, the top 11 guys. This is a very deep unit that is going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of teams. Mike, I saw you shaking your head. Yeah. So I give you the last word on this topic. Yeah, I, I agree with Connor. I think this is a team that's going to get better as the year uh, progresses. I think the offense will look better. Uh, I think that when you play capable teams that can protect, not many, but there's one big one out there, uh, the defensive secondary is going to be a question mark. There, there's not guys coming back. Uh, it's thin. You got what you got, and you got to hope that you stay healthy there, right? So to me, the secondary is, is a you know, Keely Ringo just, you know, tackling people, getting – beat badly, break an assignment, horrible graded film. Um, that's concerning, right? The head coach has talked about that. Um, you know, you, you bring up Arian Smith and and uh, Rose. These are guys, these are in year two in the program. I didn't hear of any, you know, breaking assignments for Mark. Well, but that was Keely Ringo's that. first game. I'd point that out there as well. Well, well not, let's not make it rocket science. He's playing cornerback and you cover the guy in front of you. You don't, but, but to your point, it, he is an experienced Connor and I do expect to get better. Um, the point I'm making is that you're pretty green back there. You're not very deep. And then uh, offensively, you know, talking about those receivers. I mean, the thing about Jermaine Burton that bothered me wasn't that he couldn't get separation. It's that he didn't want to put his body in front of somebody else. Okay. You don't got to be hundred percent to stick your shoulder and throw a block. And he didn't look like he wanted any part of it. That's the issue that Jermaine Burton has right now. And that's something, frankly, that'll be addressed within the team. I uh, would invite folks to check out Dog Nation Daily today. Really good stuff from Terrence Edwards, but the private conversation he had after the game with Jermaine Burton where he addressed that very same stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought it was uh, really good stuff from Jermaine Burton. I invite folks to check out Dog Nation Daily on that from today. Let's transition back to the UAB game and kind of broaden this out beyond just the offense. The game goes according to plan. Georgia's more than a three-touchdown favorite on Saturday. It's a chance to see a lot of players play. In some cases, young players that we haven't either – seen before haven't seen as much of or in some cases maybe it's guys who've been out there that you're hoping to see in kind of an expanded role on Saturday there as well Jeff who are you most interested to see whether it's a, a young guy or whether it's a a guy that you think just fits very well into the storyline for Saturday who are you interested in seeing on Saturday for the dogs I guess we we're going to say we've talked enough about the uh, quarterback position so we'll uh, segue off that one I'll keep that one uh, off limits, off topic. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of wanting to see whether, you know, one game to second game is always the biggest improvement for a lot of a lot of teams at any, at any level of football. I want to see um, the blips. I want to see who, who has an even bigger blip off the Clemson game. And for me, I'm going to look on the defensive front. Do you see bigger and better out allowed? of the Smith? 
What's that? Is that allowed? Are you allowed to take defensive guys? I think so. I think so. Um, well, we ask about what you're, what you were most excited about seeing, and you can't talk about this football team and the word exciting without going straight to the defense. I mean, let's be very real here. Um, I know the running backs will perform well. Uh, I think a lot of people, the Vogue answer, the Panama will pick, will probably say more of Brock Bowers. Um, I just want to see whether it's Nolan puts up another two sacks or it's Jalen Carter with another two sacks or Jordan Davis with another two sacks or Adam Anderson with two sacks. Let me make sure I'm covering them all. And the Kobe Dean with two sacks. Uh, Quay Walker, actually, although he was everywhere on Saturday, didn't really see his name chart a whole lot in the uh, defensive stats. So that'll be very interesting to see. Uh, you know, if you're building an All-American resume, if you're building uh, that film tape that when these guys all get drafted, folks could be about four or five Bulldogs drafted in the first round off this team uh, right now as things look. Uh, you want to see that film where they're dominating when Mel Kuypers of the world start chopping him up as the number 17, the number 24, the number eight pick, things like that. Um, I think I think the defensive guys and which guys will really – make a step forward. If I had to go to a name uh, to be near and dear to Connor's heart, I want to see who the new stop gap is long-term at, uh, at right guard. And then what that does to the rest of the offensive line with perhaps a name like uh, Broderick Jones um, or even Amari Smims getting some run tonight, getting some run on Saturday. So I think Jeff got all 85 scholarship players in on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> like, who are we supposed to pick now? <laughs> so what's your answer, Jeff? Uh, my answer is uh, J- Jack Pudlesny because we want to see a bunch of field goals. On, on if we had let Jeff go on for 30 more seconds, you'd have gotten to Wycliffe, Lovelace, and Hiawatha Berry and all the kinds of names from the past there. I, I thought we were going to get into the making of Gunnar Stockton before the end of that. And- uh, no, not yet. Not yet. I, I just want to see the defensive guys. I want to see who, who rises even further off their first week. No, I hear you on that for sure. Uh, Connor, what do you think? <laughs> Jeff kind of stole my answer, but he stole, I think, everyone's answer uh, at some point over his soliloquy there. We have, we have a lot of answer stealers on this panel. Let's be clear here. We have a lot of people that cover all the bases with their thought threads. My definitive answer is going to be Broderick Jones. Uh, I don't think he's going to start, but I'm interested in seeing. I think it's similar to Carson Beck. He's going to get a lot of run in this game. I found it interesting that Kirby Smart brought him up unprompted, saying he's ready uh, and ready to play there. And, I, I mean – Obviously losing Tate, I think Tate by the end of the season was going to clearly be one of your five best offensive linemen based on how he played in the spring and in fall camp. And so now Georgia needs to find a guy to replace that. And I think by the end of the season, that could be Broderick Jones. Now, obviously he has a long way to go to get there and needs to start getting real playing reps. But if what Kirby Smart has said is true, if his weight is up to 315 pounds, if what Nolan Smith has said is true, and he's made improvements as a run blocker, I'm interested to see how quickly Georgia gets him into this game to get him reps because while Jamari Sawyer was fantastic at left tackle on Saturday night, I think he can also be a very, very good guard for this team as well. And if you're able to get a Broderick Jones out there and sort of answer some of your other questions and have Jamari Sawyer sure up the inside of that offensive line, I think that's going to be a very positive step for not just this Georgia offensive line, but the Georgia offense as a whole. So just out of curiosity, if you don't think Jones is starting, I'm assuming you think Sire's starting at left tackle, then who's starting at right guard then? I think you're probably going to see Warren Erickson to start, and then they'll probably ease him out quickly out of the game there or move so instead why of Ron Ron. So I understand why you'd say that, but based on what Kirby said, I think it was post-game Saturday, like, like I really took that from him that they really didn't want to play Erickson and Van Braun together. I mean, they're going to have to now, unfortunately. Uh, I think you could also see Xavier Trust potentially maybe there at one of the guard spots if Georgia feels more comfortable with Jamari Sawyer at left tackle, which they might. Um, I guess what I'm getting at, I'm not trying to like put you on the witness stand here. I guess what I'm getting to is you just don't think Broderick's ready to just throw him out there, let him go from snap one? Based on what Kirby said, he said he's still got a ways to go to beat the guy in front of him. I took that as don't expect to see Broderick Jones start. I expect to see him to play in a good bit, but that first drive, if he's out there, it would run, in my opinion, kind of contradictory to what Kirby Smart had said at his press conference on Tuesday. Fair enough. Good answer. Uh, Mike, how about you? Who are you interested in seeing on Saturday? Keely Ringo. Um, you know, we, we talked earlier about what a, what a poor debut from a grading standpoint that it was. Uh, the rapid improvement. There's a reason Kirby Smart believes in this guy. Okay. And, and he talked about you can see a guy do something a thousand times in practice, but until he does it in the game, he's never done it in a game. Now Keeley, you know, has had the has that had that moment. He lived lived to tell about it, survived it. The breakdowns were not exposed. Um, so how quickly 
can he build on that performance? How much will that game film help him out uh, quick enough to hold the position over a mere speed? A guy that's waited his turn, uh, that graded out pretty well, that, that actually graded out better than him. Is this another Tyson Campbell, Eric Stokes situation? Um, you know, it, Kirby played Tyson Campbell over Eric Stokes to start 2018. And I thought Stokes should have had the job after the Missouri game, but Kirby continued on with the five star. And I think he likes the ceiling that Keely Ringo has. Keely is a, a big, physical, fast, high ceiling player who could be in the NFL in, in two years. But right now, um, you know, he's out there in a very vulnerable position. I mean, the one thing UAB does well is they're going to take some shots downfield. Are they also really worth good? noting? The oh, UAB oh, oh, oh. offensive line is bigger than the Clemson offensive line. Is UAB going to take some shots downfield on Saturday? I'll admit to not knowing that. Absolutely. Yeah, they're a play-action team, and that's one of the things that they do. I mean, this is a uh, – I mean, Roddy you know, White's not walking through that door. Some of the great Blazers receivers <laughs> of the past. Well, just uh, been trying to tell you for a long time, Brandon, that this UAB game was going to be a little tougher. And, and certainly uh, now that we're, we're looking at the prospect of – the quarterback uh, not being healthy. And, and Jeff joked around earlier, and, and Jeff doesn't poke fun at many people. That's why he's so well-liked. But but he made a joke about Jack Podlesny. I do want to see. I thought Jack Podlesny sounded shaky in his preseason interview, and he certainly looked shaky, missing a kick from the middle of the field. And there's another kicker on this team by the name of Zirkel. I'm not sure Jack Podlesny – is this is going to be the guy by the end of the year? I need to see him solidify that. I need to see him make some field goals. And uh, the the kick against Cincinnati was great, uh, historical even. But you're only as good as your last performance, and that was a huge, huge miss at Clemson. Well, I know this: if Georgia's trying a bunch of field goals against UAB on Saturday, I guess I'll be sneaking <laughs> as long as I'm at that, at that point in time. I, I don't know that I can sit through a field goal fest against UAB. That's one thing I'll agree with you on, BA. Because <laughs> um, while you know I have great respect for the Blazers' defense, uh, but hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully this is not a field goal fest back and forth one way or another. But I think all of you bring up really good names. I'm glad Connor brought up Broderick Jones and Mike. I think you're right. Generally speaking, about the secondary, I want to see more from them. I, I Half kidding, half serious. I, I guess I wonder if the UAB offense is good enough to, to you know, put that kind of pressure on them. Uh, but, I, but I think those are all really good names there as well. I mean, a guy that I kind of want to see a little bit more of to kind of go more towards the top of the list in terms of stardom here for a moment. You know, Kendall Milton was so close last week to breaking a couple of big runs. I thought what Zamir White did with his hard, tough runs at the end of the game was a, was a great story. And in addition to that, I thought some of the stuff he got from Milton last week was really fun. You know, I'm ready to see him break that big, long run. I'm excited about that possibility in front of a big home crowd. It'd be a great chance to do that. You know, it seems like whether it's Tennessee game a year ago or a couple of moments in that Clemson game, and these like short bursts, highlight type stuff, you see this interesting skill set from Milton. I'd like to see it for a you know for a longer portion of the game or show up to the tune of some really big runs there and i think in front of the home crowd be a great chance to do that you talk about breaking runs he, he broke the clemson safety he's yeah. out for the year that the long-haired young man that came up to to put a hit on kendall it was like a train wreck you know you saw him get up and tap his helmet and the next day i see a story out on the wire that his season's over with a shoulder i mean there was another you know kendall had six carries and put two guys in the injury tent. I mean, that, that's a pretty good ratio, right? One injured, injured one guy every three. And he, they're, they're bringing it on him. I mean, this is a guy, this is the next one in line, okay? Now, how and when it shakes out, I don't know. That's up to Del McGee and Kirby to decide with their, with, uh, you know, the, the, the carry ratio. Kirby said, um, got a story on Dog Nation about it. He said, nobody's going to get 20 carries. These guys need to focus on special teams, and, uh, and being good teammates, good team players. Uh, I'll tell you what, when push comes to shove and there's a game on the line, you're going to see number two back there. Until then, I think you'll see a rotation. I think the scouts and everyone else saw enough of James Cook running the ball to realize that if the wind's blowing too hard out of the open end of the end zone, he might fall down before he gets hit. This is a guy that doesn't need to carry the ball. He, he's great as a receiver, but he does nothing as a running back uh, carrying the football. I just with 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 James Cook, you call out Jermaine Burton's blocking earlier, and so now you're going to put that on James Cook as well. There, 
on his runs, not the screen action. I didn't think that was his fault. I thought they were missed blocks. But on the handoffs, Connor, I think you're wasting time handing off to that guy. You've got two other backs, three probably that are better ball carriers between the tackles than James Cook. But as I far mean, as I, I, go ahead, Connor. I would just say on James Cook's last carry, he got and picked up a third down on third and short there. So uh, I, I mean, it was, you a, know, it was a counter, but but still he he still converted it. it. Yeah, yeah that, it, that's so. Yeah, that's fair. I, I just don't. I just don't think he's hard to tackle. I think that Zamir, Kendall, Kenny are all a big step up between the tackles. I love Cook as a third down back and as a receiver. I like what he gives you. But let everybody do their strengths. You know, just as I wouldn't have Brock Bowers blocking the defensive tackle and John Fitzpatrick running a seam route, right? And, and I do understand that it's a lot to try to match your personnel to the play call. I've seen coaches. I saw Bruce Arians. This is a true story. This is an NFL coach of the year. He got fired after one year as the Alabama offensive coordinator because the running backs coach had the wrong running back in the game at the end to catch a flare pass against Auburn. And they lost because of the personnel mix up and Arians lost his job. So when you've got all these politics of a rotation going on, instead of just putting the best guy back there. And I know Kirby said that, you know, that, that it can be intimidating for a defense to have a fresh guy. Let me tell you what was intimidating. Najee Harris for four quarters. That was intimidating. And if you've got a guy who has that kind of talent, I think you got to feed, I think you got to feed the monster there, right? We saw Swift in his greatest games. All I'm saying is when push comes to shove, and we're talking about the tough opponent, whether it's BA's Auburn or my Arkansas or you know, Jeff's memories in Jacksonville, whatever weekend it is where you've got that big moment. Number two is going to be in the backfield. But, Jeff, the thing I'd point out about all this conversation about running backs is, is that, first of all, I didn't see anything from Samir White on Saturday that makes me think he should be getting less carries. But also, the year in which the Georgia running game lagged the most, we want to think about full seasons. 2020 is a little bit of its own animal. If you think about full seasons, the year in which the running game lagged the most was the year they gave the most carries to one guy, DeAndre Swift, in 2019. Now, I believe they did that for a reason. But when the running game for Georgia has been the best, not just 2017 when you had uh, – Obviously, Sonny Michelle and Nick Chubb, great success there. But in 2018, with Swift working the live at Holyfield, you saw a tandem of Georgia running backs. So I'm all fine with the discussion of at some point in time, you got to figure out who deserves to get your carries. But this is not staring at five guys trying to pick one, or right now what you think of is maybe you know uh, four guys with Edwards waiting the wings. This isn't looking at four guys saying you've got to pick one. I think this is looking at four guys saying you've got to pick two. And I think there's you know plenty of room here to talk about what I would think is probably both Zamir White and Kendall Milton here. I would say that from my taste, those are the two guys that I hope get more carries. But this is not one of those scenarios where you can only give carries to a one running back. The best versions of Georgia under Kirby Smart with Dale McGee at the helmet running backs coach. That's not the way they've done things. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. The... Go ahead, Jeff. I mean, I mean, I don't know why uh, it's a shock that Kirby and Dell want to split carries with running backs. I mean, I've only been writing for like eight years now that every running back that comes into Georgia, they want to play pro ball and they don't want to be used up at Georgia or used up anywhere in college. I think that's one of the strength of their recruit recruitments and their pitches besides the Georgia brand. And I think it's worked very stinking well for him uh, year in and year out. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with something that B.A. said. I, I guess I can go on and on about it, but. I don't know there's any way anybody watched that football game on Saturday night and doesn't think that Zamir White deserves less carries. Um, uh, if you want to make it, a, a, if you want to make it, there are always two. Uh, I think Zamir White and Kendall Will Milton should be the choice, especially right now. I was surprised nobody mentioned Kenny McIntosh is a name that they want to see more of on Saturday. Um, to me, uh, I think fans get caught up in, hey, what about? This guy's the alpha. Give him 30 carries. That's not going to happen at Georgia. 18 carries is not going to happen at Georgia. I charted the numbers for DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift, we talk about him being a primary bell cow back. He was hurt a lot at Georgia. He played hurt a lot at Georgia. And he very rarely ever went over the 18 carry mark. I, if we were doing this uh, ESPN game, I think Brandon referenced it recently, where you got the guy with the remote control and everything, he should probably dock us all points because even all the all the names that we mentioned, we didn't bring up the name Channing Tindall. Uh, that's a name I think that certainly deserves more run on Saturday against UAB. Well, let's say I'm running back just for one second on this, though, Jeff, because – I agree with a lot of what you said, but I don't think you can give four running backs equal number of carries. With all due respect to Kenny McIntosh, who I like, and James Cook, who I think could be used in an interesting way, 
the best version of Georgia offense, you can't share that load evenly because you're not giving the ball enough to somebody you think deserves. It. For me, that's Milton and uh, – Zamir right now over the other two. I think you can use McIntosh in some of the same ways you could potentially use James Cook, so figure that out. But I think the, as the Georgia offense seeks improvement, I do think you have to pare down that running back distribution a little bit. Not 20 carries for, for any guy because even Sony and, and Nick weren't necessarily toting it 20 times very much uh, at, at a time when Georgia was really running the ball a lot. But, but more carries for those guys, and you have to give less carries to somebody else because you can't throw it last when you if, if you want to be in line with what the best teams in the country are doing right you look back to that 2017 team cook air excuse me um nick chubb and sony michelle was sort of the bell cows and then they had deandre swift as the third change that's of right. pace running back i think ultimately that's what georgia needs to figure out they need to figure out the two guys that they feel comfortable having out there on an every down basis and then they they're going to have to try and find a third guy and maybe you split it up maybe injuries dictate the situation somehow but you need to find those three guys that are able to do the three things that you want to have from an offensive standpoint at the running back position. So let's finish up with our final topic here tonight. Cover four live Mike Griffith, Connor Riley, Jeff Sintel, and Brandon Adams. We are just underway here with the opening night of the NFL. Always fun on this Thursday night with the Super Bowl champs, the Dallas Cowboys here. Also, I think I saw the number today 41. It's more than 40. I think it's 41. 40 plus Georgia players on active NFL rosters to start the upcoming season. Mike, if I give you the whole list here, which of those players or a couple of players that are on the same team most likely win a Super Bowl this year or go to a Super Bowl? You'll say win a Super Bowl. Which of those players most likely to win a Super Bowl this year? Wow. You know, that that's that's tough. Yeah, I, I haven't done a whole lot of handicapping uh, of the NFL yet. I, I suppose early on, I don't know if I really believe it, but I'll say it just because I'm hoping that Matt Stafford uh, is an answer in the Rams and, and they have a storybook season. Uh, you know, I think about him. Uh, I, I wonder about the Green Bay Packers. I'm going to do a Jeff here, right? Uh, the Eric Stokes. Stokes. Yeah. Let's limit it to one team. Come on, some <laughs> of us have. To, some of us are going to get their teams day. Well, in each division, Brandon. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. You know what? I'm going to. Mike's go playing roulette. Time. He's trying to get himself a corner yeah. of the wheel right there. Just trying to occupy that corner of the wheel. But gut, I, I gut, yeah. gut feeling, gut, just pure gut feeling. Green Bay Packers and Eric Stokes. Uh, well, it's actually the first team that you mentioned that I think is the most interesting here. I think Stafford and the Rams is fascinating. For a guy that's what? He's a 12-year veteran. I think mm-hmm. he's been in the NFL for a mm-hmm. long time now. And obviously, any quarterback would want to play with Sean McVay. And frankly, any player would want to get out of Detroit if they possibly could. You know, I'm not saying that I'm going to pick him to go to the Super Bowl. But for fun and in a question like this, the Rams might be my answer. And obviously, that brings you know a guy like Stafford to the conversation. What do you think, Connor? Well, it's not just Stafford on that Rams team. You've got Leonard Floyd. You've got yep. Sony Michelle. You've got yep. J.R. Reed. You've got a lot of guys on that team that have Georgia ties there. Thomas Brown, former Georgia running backs coach, That's along right. with the Georgia running back himself. Uh, my answer, though, is Miko Hardman in the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, really? They have Patrick Mahomes. It's Patrick Mahomes. I'm not If he's healthy, I'm not betting against him. They made significant strides to shore up their offensive line. I think Miko is actually set to play a much bigger role for this Chiefs offense this year given some of the depth they have at the wide receiver position. I think Mike brings up a good point there with Eric Stokes as well. See, it's but kind of Rams, funny, Chief, Rams Chiefs is my preseason Super Bowl pick. And it's I have kind of Chiefs funny that you say that because like some of the stuff I've been kind of listening to, people I've been talking to, it seems like people are down on the Chiefs a little bit after last year's Super Bowl. Are you not seeing some of that? I mean, apparently you don't agree with it, but are you not seeing some like anti-Chiefs sentiment lately? Well, so you hear you met you both you and Mike both mentioned the Rams. They have Stafford, they're the hot new team. You have yeah. obviously the Rodgers melodrama and up there, and it's the last run yeah. there in Green Bay. The Chiefs are stale at this point. We know what they are. They're going to score 40 points a game. They're going to be unstoppable. They're going to score 28 of them in one quarter, and the game's going to be over at halftime. And they're just kind of boring at this point. I, I've said before, I don't think this Chiefs team is good for football because with Mahomes, they're so dominant offensively that it just makes it really hard to enjoy a full 60-minute game. And so because of that, because of they're not, there's, there's, there's not this newness. They've been to two straight Super Bowls, three straight AFC Championship games with Mahomes. There's not the excitement about them that there are, say, about the Rams or even the Bills who or, or Browns who appear to be on the come up. The comment section is mentioning the name that I think is an, actually a very interesting name to have in this discussion. And he's not the only player on this team either. But I'm going to give Jeff a chance to answer. Then I want to give shouts out to the comment section because they're all over who I think should be a big part of this discussion. Jeff, uh, you got somebody? 
Yeah, I got one. It's kind of uh, it's kind of sentimental, though. Uh, you know, you wonder what's not what's not on the board here, uh, and I think I'd like to see Ben Cleveland do something with the Ravens. Uh, I think he's a good fit for that uh, team. Now they can't keep a running back healthy. Heck, Todd Gurley might sign with them tonight um, uh-huh. with all the running yeah with all the running backs going down, but. Um, I, you, you know, that's Connor took my answer to, to be totally honest. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, if I was truly sentimental, I would say Richard LeCount and Nick Chubb at Cleveland, but that's not happening. Well, no, 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 no. Be very careful here. Be very careful because that's the name I want to bring up. And, and uh, Jesse Dellinger, uh, 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 Bryce Dixon, a lot of folks bringing this up. They're only 12 to 1. They're Super Bowl Hutch 12 to 1 right now. That's a team that has very legitimate certainly big time postseason aspirations. And I think that if you're going to say it's not Kansas city, I think a team like Cleveland is very much in that conversation. And the cool thing here is Nick Chubb may be the biggest reason why. Uh, Kevin yeah, I think is a very run heavy coach. I think their receiver room is kind of the same mass unit that the Georgia receiver room is. You can kind of count on OBJ or Jarvis Landry or on down the line, whether it's Callaway or their tight ends, uh, they they just don't have that. You may I think we should probably just bring up Arizona as well. They've got Air, they've got um, AJ Green now at Arizona. They got a couple other Bulldogs there as well. I mean, <laughs> no, the, Arizona, is, Arizona. Is uh, uh, one more name. So I saw somebody mention here. This is a this is certainly a deep cut. Uh, Isaiah McKenzie and the Buffalo Bills. Uh, oh yeah, probably going to win the <laughs> AFC East once again this season. Um, he's a player for them. They use him in really creative ways. You know, you you hope maybe Todd Munkin. T- takes a look at what Brian Dayball is doing up there in, in Buffalo and getting skilled players the balls in certain situations. But I could certainly see, and I'm sure BJ or Boss would be thrilled if the Buffalo Bills are in Los Angeles uh, in the Super Bowl. Would we say that Jake Fromm has a better chance of getting a Super Bowl ring than Justin Fields this year? Yeah, he, Jake Fromm's not on an active roster, so until, he until gets I a see ring. that, but yeah, he he does get a Super Bowl ring though. I think that Justin Fields is already the most popular athlete in the entire city of Chicago right now. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Already the most popular athlete. Well, they traded their entire baseball team, so. Right. You know. There's nobody yeah. left in the Cubs. <laughs> Although, I guess the White Sox have – White Sox have a few star players right now, but yeah. uh, Fields has got the whole town. The White Sox have to settle for the south side here. Um, right, let's do a couple of comments. We'll get ready to go. Let's see what else. Uh, DMAR42 says UAB is a premium Low tier program. They regularly lose one or two games a year. But as group of five teams go, this is a pretty good group of five team. Now, I'm one of these dorks that's like always watching like the bowl games before Christmas. Like, I'm one of these guys that's like December the 17th at 2 p.m. watching some game being played in the snow in Montgomery or something like that. Like, yeah. you know, this is the UAB team I've seen a pretty good bit. And to give them credit, first of all, if you haven't seen the helmets they're wearing on Saturday, I am scared to think how much I might pay for one of these replica helmets of the UAB blazer with the American flag color scheme, obviously in honor of the, the 20th anniversary or not anniversary, but 20th year observance of, um, uh, of what happened on nine 11. So I'll be a serious thing. I'm making a lot of it right now, but those helmets are beautiful. They're wearing on Saturday. Um, this is a program that over the years, and Mike knows the history here completely job by the university of Alabama. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised that Mike doesn't like him more because the fact, uh, you know, Paul Bryant jr. And, Going back to the Gene Bartow era as the basketball. Boy, the conspiracy wow. theory was with UAB. Yeah, that's right up Mike's alley. Wow. <laughs> but, I mean, if, if you – like, just do me a favor. If you don't know their story, spend five seconds Googling, like, the Bryant family, Gene Bartow, UAB. For those of us that really love, like, the good Southern soap opera, this is juicy stuff. Um, they had Jimbo Fisher hired as head coach one time that got blocked by the Alabama board of regents. This is a program that's had to fight every single day just to have a program. And here they are after having the thing shuttered unfairly, they're back, they're playing in bowl games. They're winning conference USA. I weirdly have a little soft spot in my heart for UAB. Not this we'll Saturday. See how, yeah. We'll see how soft that spot is on Saturday when it's, <laughs> when it's 14 to three in the third quarter. <laughs> yeah. I may have a soft spot on my noggin too, from banging against the, uh, the, the wall when this is all said and done. Uh, Jeff, you got a final thought here while I pull up another comment. Uh, I think I got one. I got one. Of Connor has a great one. I think Connor has <laughs> yeah. a great one. So uh, Saturday is going to be the first time in over a year that 92,000 fans are going to be in Woo! Sanford Stadium. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'll admit in the early days of the pandemic, when I was someone who wanted to get sports back out there, I did not think that the crowds would matter all that much. 
Uh, I was dead wrong about that. And being in an atmosphere last week uh, in Charlotte where it was 50-50, maybe 55-45, Georgia maybe there. Uh, I'll tell you, when they play, when Cupson should be furious. Whoever played uh, Babaro O'Reilly there. That was so order, funny. Uh, uh, they, you know, Clemson had just started to start take momentum there. I they should have been like because I felt that really energized the Georgia crowd there and allowed Georgia to sort of take that game home. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what that atmosphere is like. Ninety two thousand fans in the stadium on Saturday. I think it's going to be a really cool atmosphere. And while you know, obviously, you worry a little bit about the letdown. I actually think because this is the first home game in so long with so many fans there, it's going to have these guys really juiced and energized and ready to go. First of all, Connor's right. The time they played the Baba O'Reilly thing after Clemson, I think it what kicked the field goal and scored. Yep. And like this is Clemson trying to get back in the football game, and they just cranked that thing up, and the whole Georgia crowd's going crazy. What a moment that was! And if you're Clemson, I've got to imagine you're furious about that. But Mike, we'll finish with this. What I find amazing is not only does it make the stadium atmosphere so much better, and it does. That thing last year, no matter what ballpark you're in, it was just awful with the uh, you know the fake crowd noise. But it's amazing how many more people seem to want to watch on TV because the crowds was there. You got a TV audience, about 8 million people for Georgia Clemson on Saturday, as has been reported this week. That's higher than most of the NBA Finals games. Uh, I mean, there was huge, huge uh, appetite for these games on TV. It is just amazing how much the presence of fans kind of validates the sport in a way that you could not recreate last year in the empty stadiums. Yeah, I think it was the second most watched uh, opening game. Um, I don't know what the time frame was, but it's it's incredible. So, so I'm going to be the wet blanket here. I'm going to be the wet blanket here. Uh, more than 30% of the Georgia students have COVID per the most recent COVID stats. This is scary. Yeah, Connor's amazed by this. That I can can't see. be right. No, that's, that's like what, that's that's like 12,000 people having COVID. The, among the, the I'm telling you, with the, the data from the Mark Kuhlman. Uh, to me, I think we're at a point where there should be seating sections for vaccinated and unvaccinated. Then you can do whatever you want and everybody's happy. Have an unvaccinated section. Hey, everybody's cool. Have a vaccinated section. The fact that Georgia can't take any protocol because of their board of regents in this era is one of the most mind boggling things I've ever seen. And it runs counter to what Greg Sankey told us in Birmingham. You know, there was such a strong message on behalf of Commissioner Sankey, about 85, 90% vaccination rates on teams. We've seen Kirby Smart uh, and Nick Saban, uh, both with the strong vaccination messages for their fan bases. And yet athens Clark County only has a 21% fully vaccinated rate. Uh, 92,000 people in close quarters with the, uh, I know this for sure, Connor, uh, the Georgia uh, students, COVID rate has doubled in the last week. Um, granted, they're younger people and they're healthy people, but I, I say I prevent I present this sobering news to encourage everyone to be cautious, to be careful, to take care of your loved ones, um, because uh, this stuff is pretty still pretty real. And um, it did, very disappointing to me though that the Georgia Board of Regents, supposedly great men and academians. Uh, Aren't, aren't allowed to do any sort of COVID protocol at a game like this. And I'm seeing it at other places. I'm seeing it at Louisiana, for goodness sakes. So, and then my idea about the, the two seating sections, it doesn't just have to be for college football. I, I say for all sports or maybe even on airplanes, vaccinated, unvaccinated, different seating. So that's my, that's my solution for now to that issue. Well, there you go. We'll leave it there for that with uh, cover four live here today. Folks, we will see you again next week at the same time. And I'll see you tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. for Dog Nation Daily. We will talk about the big buildup for the home opener for the dogs. and a lot of folks excited about being there and enjoying that chance to tailgate. And so many things that we're not able to do a year ago, getting a chance to come back and have a good time doing that outdoors uh, on Saturday. So excited about all of that. Also, Jeff Sintel stops by. Get the latest UGA recruiting from him. So yeah, I got some stats from Connor. Three, three and three point eight percent, I think, was the stat. So one out of thirty-three of the Georgia students. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you so much. So we will um, leave it here for now. Mike, Connor, got a bunch of good stuff coming on the website. Jeff, following uh, all kinds of visitors as they roll in. So busy, busy weekend at DogNation.com on all the Dog Nation platforms. We'll see you after the game at UJ Bookstore for the Dog Nation Post Game Show. So much going on. We will see you there and talk to you next Thursday at the same time for Cover 4 Live. Have a great night, everybody.